Well, it only seems fitting that since we just did how to compress a guitar, that we would follow up with how to EQ one. Compression and EQ are the building blocks of mixing, but these don't just stop at the mixing phase. Even if you play live shows or just jam in your room, these will be extremely useful tips to have under your belt. By the end of this video, it will basically be impossible for you to make a terrible guitar tone. Shout out to the 10 people in the comments that are gonna say challenge accepted. Well, I accept your challenge because I'm just that confident confident in my thought process. Not only that, but I'll be unveiling a new JST plugin that people have been asking about for the better part of five years. So what's happening fam? Miami here with JST and one of the most powerful things I learned from Joey firsthand was how to make epic guitar tones without having tons of expensive gear. And now that I actually have some pretty nice gear, it makes it even more apparent how important getting the fundamentals right was. EQ is literally everything, man. So I just thought that when I finally saw his process, I see tons of crazy EQ moves, but that wasn't the case. Very little was needed to get to a finished product. And I started applying this concept, not just to my mixes, but to my life. You always feel like you need to do something crazy to get to the finish line, but that's just not reality in the mixing game when you're starting off with good source material. So let's get into it. The first step of EQing any guitar doesn't start with a channel strip or even the JST EQ plugin. It starts Wait, with- since when does JST have an EQ plugin? Relax, bro. So as I was saying before I was rudely interrupted, EQing a guitar doesn't start with an EQ, but it might still start with a plugin, the amplifier. The first step to EQing any guitar tone is the amp itself. Bass, mids, treble, not too different than settings you would see on a car speaker or even your computer audio settings. Dialing in an amp is the first point in which you affect the overall equalization of your guitar tone. People are way too quick to just reach for JST EQ when, bruh, that's not even out yet. At least wait until it's out to start saying that. As I was saying, People are too quick to reach for an EQ plugin before taking their time learning to get a solid source tone. You typically want something that doesn't have exaggerated mids, has a balanced high end, which you'll use the treble and presence knob for, and lows that do not compete for space with the bass and kick. What people tend to do when they have pushed their lows and highs too much is compensate with EQ. But we're gonna get to that in a second. I did a video showing how to dial in amp tones from the major amp sim companies, so make sure to watch that if you have trouble getting a solid guitar source tone to start with. But here's a clip of dialing both a clean and distorted guitar tone with Toneforge Jeff Loomis. If you're a big fan of the sounds you just heard, head to the link in the description to get your free trial of this plugin today. And now let's get onto some EQ moves. As I was saying before, the first thing people do when they've pushed the lows and highs too much is compensate for it with EQ. And there's nothing wrong with that. To be honest, it's easier removing the extra highs and lows when it comes to guitars, because if you try to add them with just an EQ, it isn't gonna add any of that additional harmonic distortion that would happen when doing it with a guitar amp or amplifier. And that goes for plugins or real life. Let's find the spots in which we should roll off the extra highs and extended subs and lows. And I don't want my subs to be at an all time low, so make sure you hit that subscribe button, like button, and notification bell. Transition game is still crazy. So it'll typically range range from 75 to 150 hertz in the low end and 10 to 12k in the high end depending on how far you've pushed the presence and treble knob.
See how much more modern and clean that sounds now that we've cleaned up everything on top and below. But let's say you've done this and it isn't fitting with the rest of what you have going on in the song. It might be time to make the biggest change to the EQ curve that you can. Changing the cabinet or impulse response. When it comes to an IR, you have to remember that it's literally an EQ curve of the speaker cabinet. And by switching between them, you're changing the entire sonic signature of your tone. This isn't just for heavy music. It's the same concept when you're using an IR of a Fender Twin Reverb. So try to think of impulses as EQ presets because that's basically what they are. But as we know, with most presets, a little tweaking is necessary to make it work perfectly for our situation. The tweaking in this scenario will be some EQ after the fact. But let's go through some impulses from the Conquer All IR pack and find one that works really well with the guitar tone that we have and make it fit with the bass and drums going on. Perfect. The link for that is also in the description below. Just saying. Now, I want you to remember, amps and cabs work with each other to find a tone, but if you hadn't dialed in something decent in the first place, switching through IRs would have been pointless. You might need to go back and make a couple adjustments to the amp tone to make it work with your new cabinet or IR. But now that we've done this, there are some common areas that we need to check for, and we're gonna do this one by one. We're gonna break this into two categories. I just held up four fingers, but two categories. Surgical EQ and broadband EQ. When it comes to guitars, there are some common areas that come up specifically in distorted guitars, so we're gonna be going over that, starting with surgical. You can start a frequency sweep with an EQ at any time to find ringing frequencies. A couple areas you're gonna to wanna to check for from the beginning are 500 to 700 hertz area, and the fizziness in the 4K region. These are the two biggest problem areas that come up and I tend to notice them being harshest when being used with a condenser microphone versus a dynamic. The ringing in the 500 to 700 hertz area is reminiscent of the frequency of a sonar beep. So once you've heard that, it means that you found it. One thing I can't stress enough with surgical EQ is that you don't wanna to cut too much because what will happen is the harmonic of that frequency will become exaggerated. AKA, if you cut too much 700 hertz, 1400 hertz will become an issue. So just be mindful of that. And let's find that annoying ringing frequency. Now that we've dealt with that and we're sure we aren't producing any harmonic issues, we can move on to the 4K region. The 4K area is extremely fatiguing because our ear canals are literally designed to be sensitive to it. Common things like nails on a chalkboard live in the same area. So here's an interesting thought that uh, crossed my mind the other day. Why is it that we can cut so much 4K and it's never an issue? It's because we love the sound of 8K. So when we make a major cut to 4K, it's just producing a harmonic of an area that we like. So you don't have to be as careful about doing those large cuts if need be. And in fact, I would say it might actually have been helpful all along without anyone realizing that's why we did this. So onto broadband EQ. A really nice area to use broadband EQ is the low mids. This is where the mud typically lies in guitar tracks and is one of the reasons the Andy Sneap trick was so popular. The difference is that Andy Sneap trick is using multiband compression to target that area when it becomes overwhelming and broadband EQ would just get rid of the problem once and for all. And it's all a taste thing depending on the source, right? But if you're really into the idea of things being dynamic, you can use a dynamic EQ to make it all work. This area is typically a problem, but can get really bad once you start palm muting and it builds up the frequencies. Let me show you guys this area and how effective it can be to get it under control.
So now we've gone over all of the things that go into EQing a guitar tone. The amplifier, low end and high end roll off, impulse response choice, surgical EQ, and broadband EQ. With these tools under your belt, you should now have a pretty great understanding of how to EQ a guitar, and it shouldn't take tons of wild moves to get you to a great sound. But there's nothing wrong with being creative either. These are just some basics to get you something that sounds awesome with minimal work. Are there any areas you feel like I missed? Does this clarify any questions you had with EQing guitars in the past? Leave it in the comments below and I will chat with you like I always do. If you're an engineer on the come up, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, you only have to do it one time. And tap that bell for notifications so when a video drops, you know the location. Until next time, I am out of here. Mic drop, <laughs> except as engineers we know, I'd never really drop this thing, cause that'd get really expensive. Even if it is a piece of sure. <laughs> Later.